making the headlines tonight. Prime Minister Hun Sen has presided over the inauguration ceremony of the new office building of the General Department of Customs and Excise of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. PM Hun Sen reacts to former Thai foreign minister and Malaysian opposition criticising his visit to Myanmar and defends Myanmar's seat at the ASEAN group. PM shares letter written by his son Hun Manit while studying in New York in 1994. PM announces Pfizer vaccine will be used as fourth dose to frontline workers. And what sounds like a story from Jurassic Park is in fact reality. Scientists have found a dinosaur egg to contain a 72 million year old embryo. This is the Daily Roundup on the EAC News Channel. A very good evening to you. My name is Paolo Bonini. Thursday morning, and Prime Minister Hun Sen has presided over the inaugurational ceremony of the new office building for the General Department of Customs and Excise of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. The date coincides with the 70th anniversary of the establishment of the Customs Administration in Cambodia. In addition to the inauguration of the administration building, the ceremony has also been linked to the inauguration of the National Customs School and the Customs Museum, which is under renovation. EAC News reporter Yuri Matosko has the details. The 35-story administrative building of the General Department of Customs and Excise of Cambodia was officially inaugurated on Thursday morning under the High Presidency of the Prime Minister of Cambodia. The new building started construction in February 2017 and completed in July 2020. It is 120 meters high, 54 meters long, and more than 26 meters wide. With the budget of $33 million, the GDC's new office building is composed of office, meeting rooms, canteen, fitness club, sauna rooms, and a sky bar on its top. The General Department of Customs and Excise of Cambodia was established during the Samkhan era by the Royal Crown, dated back in 1951. During the Khmer Rouge regime, between 1975 and 1979, the operation of the General Department of Customs and Excise was suspended. The unit resumed operations on July 1979 under the auspices of the Ministry of Commerce. However, it was transferred under the supervision of the Ministry of Economy and Finance through a sub-decree dated in March 1988. The Customs and Excise Office was established as the General Department of Customs and Excise of Cambodia through a sub-decree in 2008. Now, with its new office building, the Cambodian Customs and Excise Administration building not only enhances the image of state institutions and provides a suitable place, but it also shows the progress of the kingdom under the leadership of Prime Minister Hun Sen after the remnants of the flames of war, with the Prime Minister strongly supporting modernization of the National Sovereignty Services. At the inauguration ceremony, Prime Minister Hun Sen said the GDCE and the General Department of Taxation are the two major institutions representing the sovereign services of the nation. Prime Minister Hun Sen expressed his firm stance to protect the sovereign services and oppose an attempt to interfere in them, revealing that some foreign experts had recommended Cambodia to sell the customs services to private company under customs services reforms. In addition to the inauguration of the administration building, the National Customs School and the Customs Museum have also been inaugurated. The construction of the National Customs School began in October 2019, costing $9.5 million. It was completed in October 2021. Set at the OCIC development area, Kan Chiroi Changva, Phnom Penh, it has 12 floors, reaching a total area of 20,000 square meters. The Customs Museum building was renovated in August 2020 and completed in November 2020, costing $350,000. During the ceremony, Prime Minister Hun Sen has delivered strong messages regarding untaxed vehicles on the roads as well as regional matters, such as his position to maintain Myanmar seats at the ASEAN Group.
Prime Minister Hun Sen has also stated that even after he has resigned from his role as Prime Minister in the future, Deputy Prime Minister Aung Puan Mandirot will continue to retain his position as Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy and Finance. Deputy Prime Minister Aung Puan Mandirot was the former personal secretary of Prime Minister Hun Sen since 1991 when he returned from studying in Russia. He has been serving as the Minister of Economy and Finance since 2013, after many years as Secretary of State. Prime Minister Hun Sen has also spoken regarding the Director General of the General Department of Customs and Excise, Kam Yim, expressing his command of postponing Kam Yim's retirement for 2025. The Prime Minister has stated that Kum Yim should postpone his retirement, since he hasn't shown any sign of age, having strength and ability to lead the customs institution, an important sector of government responsible for collecting national income and revenues. The current Director General of the General Department of Customs and Excise, Kum Yim, has been in charge since September of 2014, replacing Mr. Pen Simon, who retired. The Prime Minister of Cambodia has also announced the royal government will not increase the salaries of civil servants and the armed forces in 2022, but if the economic of COVID-19 crisis is better and the income increases, the royal government will increase the salary in 2023. Prime Minister Hun Sen has requested an understanding and tolerance of civil servants and the armed forces for the inability to increase the salaries in 2021 until 2022. Prime Minister Hun Sen stated that, however, the royal government has made efforts to maintain macroeconomic stability, curb inflation, maintain the purchasing power of the Cambodian Riel in order to keep the prices of goods in the country from rising. His message is stressed that won't increase the salary, but won't let the prices of goods go up. The head of state also called on civil servants and armed forces of all levels of administration to participate in tax collection to increase the national economy and lead to an later increase of salaries. Yuri Matosko, EAC News. Prime Minister Hun Sen once again announced that vehicles that have not yet had their taxes paid before the deadline of the 31st of December this year will not be allowed on the roads. He made this announcement during his speech on Thursday morning while inaugurating the new 35-storey administration building for the General Department of Customs and Excise of Cambodia. EAC News reporter Dashana Gochan has more. Prime Minister Hun Sen called on all car owners to hurry up and pay their taxes before the deadline on 31st December 2021 in order to receive a 10% tax concession. He stressed that those vehicles which have not yet had their taxes paid for after this deadline will no longer be allowed to drive on the road. According to the General Department of Customs and Excise, as of 14 December 2021, there are still around 3,000 registered vehicles with unpaid taxes both left- and right-hand driving cars, under various license plates, with unpaid taxes amounting to more than 28 million U.S. dollars. The department also estimates that there are many vehicles that are using fake special license plates, such as KM military license plates, to avoid paying taxes. Darshana Gauchan, EAC News. On Wednesday, the Vietnamese President Ji Yang Chong Puk has concluded his official two-day state visit to Cambodia at the invitation of the king, Norodong Sihamoni. The visit has been concluded with great success. The president's visit also marked the opening of the Vietnamese-Cambodia Friendship Year of 2022, which commemorates the 55th anniversary of the establishment of Cambodia-Vietnamese diplomatic relations. EAC News reporter Yuri Matosko has more. The Vietnamese president completed his two-day state visit to Cambodia on Wednesday afternoon, following a morning breakfast with Prime Minister Hun Sen, courtesy visits to the Buddhist Great Supreme Patriarch General Thep Vong and Supreme Patriarch Bo Kli, and a final visit to the Embassy of Vietnam in Cambodia. On Tuesday, the president paid courtesy visits to King Norodong Sihamouni and Queen Mother Norodong Moninyet Sihanouk, Senate President Tsai Chum, National Assembly President Heng Samran, and Prime Minister Hun Sen. 
Following his visit with National Assembly President Hem Samran, President Yuan Shuanpuk attended the groundbreaking ceremony of the new administrative building of the National Assembly, which is being constructed with a $25 million donation from the government of Vietnam. A particular highlight of President Yuan Shuanpuk's visit was the signing ceremony held with Prime Minister Hun Sen of seven bilateral agreements regarding matters related to security, defense, culture, technology, education, and border trade. The Vietnamese president also laid rafts at Independence Monument, the Monument of the Late King Father of Cambodia, and the Cambodian-Vietnam Friendship Monument. The official joint statement released by the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam affirmed that the Vietnamese president's visit was held in an atmosphere of solidarity, friendship, mutual understanding and trust, and the leaders of both countries briefed each other on the current developments in their respective countries and had in-depth exchanges of views on all dimensions of bilateral cooperation. The statement outlines that both sides expressed satisfaction over the comprehensive, close-knit cooperation between Vietnam and Cambodia over the past 55 years, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, where both countries provided mutual assistance in difficult times. Cambodian expresses a sincere gratitude for the strong support and assistance that various generations of leaders and people of Vietnam have accorded to the people of Cambodia in the past and present, and includes that the country will always remember the assistance provided by Vietnamese soldiers to liberate Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge regime in 1979. The statement added that President Nguyen Xuan Puc also expresses appreciation to the Kingdom of Cambodia for the continuous support and non-discriminatory treatment extended to the people of Vietnamese origin living in Cambodia. Overall, the two sides have expressed high satisfaction and appreciation for the successful outcomes of the Vietnamese President's state visit to Cambodia, which kicks off a series of activities in celebration of the 55th anniversary of the establishment of Cambodian-Vietnam diplomatic relations. Yuri Batosko, EAC News. Prime Minister Hun Sen has shared pictures of a handwritten letter sent by his son, Hun Manet, in 1994, whilst he was studying at New York University. The Prime Minister wrote in a Facebook post that he decided to share this personal family letter since nearly three decades have passed, and many of the aspirations his son wrote about have come to fruition. EAC News reporter Dashana Gochan has more. Prime Minister Hun Sen shared a handwritten letter sent by his son Hun Manet from 28 years ago and addressed to his parents while he was studying in New York. In the letter, Hun Manet describes his study goals, including studying to become a pilot or infantryman and studying economics and politics up until his PhD. Prime Minister Hun Sen proudly wrote in his Facebook post that his son already has the economic, political, and military knowledge as contained in the letter, including a PhD in economics. The Prime Minister explained that he wished to share this letter in order for the public to get to understand his son better. He added that what is not contained in the letter is that Hun Manet went to Congo for an internship with the World Bank after earning his Master's of Arts in Economics at New York University. Prime Minister Hun Sen also shared that his son had once gone to live with a host family in France, where he was hired to pick apples and learn French, and that while he was studying for his doctorate in the UK, his son had taught math to second- and third-year students to earn some extra money to reduce his parents' expenses. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. A new oral antiviral drug for treatment of mild to moderate cases of COVID-19 in adults, Monupira, will begin sales to companies in Cambodia on Thursday. The agreed import of this drug to Cambodia was announced by the Working Group for the Management, Distribution and Supply of Strategic Medicines for Combating COVID-19. EAC News reporter Tashana Gochan has more details. The molnupiravir drug, which is marketed under the name Molnatris, was approved for distribution in Cambodia in November by the Ministry of Health. Molnatris will be sold at $55 per box, containing 40 tablets. Individuals will be able to order between 5 to 10 boxes each. 
private hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, and sub-pharmacies with official business licenses can order between 10 to 200 doses and resell the drug up to $65 per box. Additionally, reorders for the medicine can be made at least two weeks after the last order. Molnitris can be ordered directly from the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications during working hours between Monday to Friday. Darshana Gauchen, EAC News. An inauguration ceremony of the new office building of the General Department of Customs and Excise this morning, Prime Minister Hun Sen has stated the royal government is preparing the fourth doses of Australian donated Pfizer for the frontline officials, as well as planning measures to prevent a national lockdown. EAC News reporter Yuri Matosko has more information. Speaking at the inauguration ceremony of the new office building of the General Department of Customs and Excise, Prime Minister Hun Sen said the COVID-19 pandemic has so far killed more than 3,000 people. But with the daily cases dropping nearly to zero, the big challenge now is economy recovery. He has stated that if the national economy fails, it can affect the whole 16 million Cambodian citizens. The Prime Minister continued that more than 3 million people have already accessed the third doses of COVID-19 vaccine, while the fourth doses will be reserved for some 500,000 frontline workers. According to Prime Minister Hun Sen, the fourth doses for the frontline officials will be Pfizer vaccines donated by Australia. At the same time, he pointed out that eight cases of Omicron have now been detected in Cambodia, but all are imported cases. He once again appealed to the public not to get into panic. The head of state of Cambodia reminded his compatriots to stick to the health preventive measures and to get vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. Yuri Matosko, EAC News. Cambodia's daily COVID-19 numbers now total 120,434. Four new cases have been recorded overnight. Ten patients were successfully treated and discharged yesterday evening. That makes the total recoveries 116,834. Yet again, no deaths were recorded. Cambodia's total deaths since the beginning of the pandemic now stand at 3,006. Active cases, 594. The Omicron variant has taken hold to become the dominant COVID-19 variant in the United States, as more people are traveling and gathering for holidays. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is working with state and local public health officials to monitor the spread of Omicron. As of December 20, 2021, Omicron has been detected in most states and territories and is rapidly increasing the proportion of COVID-19 cases it is causing. The infection cases caused by Omicron accounted for 73.2% of all infection cases in the week ending 18 December from 12.6% of all infection cases in the week, according to the latest model estimates of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on Monday. At the beginning of this month, Omicron only accounted for 0.7% of all infection cases. Omicron is spreading rapidly nationwide and has been found in at least 48 of the 50 U.S. states as of Monday, since the first case in the country was detected in California on 1st December. COVID-19 cases, deaths and hospitalizations have continued to surge in the United States. The country is averaging about 130,000 new cases daily, a 10% increase from the previous week, the latest CDC data showed. The New York State set a new COVID-19 infection record for a third straight day on Sunday, with more than 22,000 positive cases. People waited in long line at testing sites. With the surging of COVID-19 infections, Washington DC on Monday reimposed the indoor mask mandate and has required a vaccination mandate for government employees. However, the surge in new infections did not deter people from flying for holidays. The US Transportation Security Administration has screened over 2 million passengers for a fourth day in a row. The TSA expected up to 21 million Americans will fly between 23 December to 3 January from the holiday season. 
Health experts have urged the public to test before heading for travels and large gatherings, getting vaccinated and boosted, masking in public indoor settings and practicing physical distancing to slow transmissions. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said on Tuesday that there were no plans for an in-person meeting between the President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin amid tensions over a Russian troop buildup on its border with Ukraine. It was pretty unlikely that a face-to-face -face meeting between President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin would take place as Russia continues to build up its military along its border with Ukraine. The United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, further says that they have to see if there is any progress diplomatically. He has even mentioned that the United States wants to see Russia de-escalate, to move forces back from the border with Ukraine and reduce the tension. The United States simply wants to see Russia pull back forces from the border and to see Russia engage in good faith in diplomacy and diplomatic dialogue with Europe and with Ukraine to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine and to give Ukraine its borders back. The group of seven countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the UK and the US, have released a statement condemning Russia's actions at the Ukraine border. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine itself, uh, we've said, we've long said that the, the best way to resolve the, the conflict in eastern Ukraine and to restore to Ukraine the border uh, that it's entitled to uh, is through the so-called Minsk process, the agreements that Russia and Ukraine reached um, uh, many years ago now uh, to, uh, to resolve the, uh, these differences peacefully. And there, uh, we're very much prepared to, uh, to try to facilitate that, to act in support of what France and Germany are doing with Russia and Ukraine. And, what's called the Normandy uh, format. So we're working on all of those lines. Uh, whether uh, that leads to, um, at some point, another meeting between uh, the president uh, and, and, and President Putin, uh, I, 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 I leave that for another day. There are no plans uh, to do that now. I think uh, we have to see if, in the first instance, there's any progress dip diplomatically. We also want to see Russia de-escalate to move forces back from the border with, uh, with Ukraine, to take down uh, the tension. Uh, it's um, much more appropriate to have a conversation uh, in those circumstances than it is when um, the escalation is happening, not de-escalation. Now for a look at the news making international headlines this Thursday, the 23rd of December. On Wednesday, the United States has authorized Pfizer oral antiviral COVID-19 pill for at-risk people aged 12 and above, making it the first at-home treatment for the coronavirus in a potentially important tool in the fight against the fast-spreading Omicron variant. Data from Pfizer's clinical trial has showed its antiviral regimen, Faxlobid, was 90% effective in preventing hospitalization in deaths in patients at high risk of severe illness. Recent lab data suggests the drug retains its effectiveness against Omicron, Pfizer has claimed. Pfizer has said it was ready to start immediate delivery in the United States of the treatment whose two-drug regimen includes a new medicine and a second older antiviral called ritonavir, and raised its 2022 production projections to 120 million courses of treatment from 80 million. The agency's decision comes at the country's combats a surge in COVID-19 cases driven by the Omicron variant, with U.S. President Joe Biden announcing plans for more federal vaccination in testing sites. The U.S. government contact for 10 million courses of the Pfizer drug is priced at $530 per course. The agency has announced it's authorized the oral drug for emergency use for the treatment of mid to moderate disease in adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19. 
The drug is available by prescription only and should be initiated as soon as possible after diagnosis of COVID-19 and within five days of symptom onset. The agency has said the second drug, ritonavir, is known to have interactions with some other prescriptions medicines. Pfizer has said that should be manageable and suggested most patients would be also to lower the dose of their other medications while being treated for COVID-19. Pfizer has plans to file a new drug application with the FDA in 2022 for potential full regulatory approval. Nigeria on Wednesday has destroyed more than a million doses of expired AstraZeneca vaccines in a bid to assure a wary public that they have been taken out of circulation. The destruction came more than a week after health authorities have said some COVID-19 doses donated by rich Western nations had a shelf life that left only weeks to administer the shots. Around 1 million COVID-19 vaccines were estimated to have expired in Nigeria in November without being used. Uh, we have promised you uh, in the last couple of days that we have successfully withdrawn about 1,066,214 doses of expired hey, AstraZeneca mind. vaccines. As you can see, these vaccines have now been deposited by the Abuja Environmental Protection Agency. We have come through in our promise to all Nigerians to be transparent in our delivery of vaccines. These vaccines did not expire before we took the decision to withdraw them. Today is an opportunity for Nigerians to have further faith in our vaccination program. This is uh, the handing over ceremony that NABDAC is re receiving the 1 million plus doses of vaccines and now NABDAC will destroy it in collaboration with Primary Health. At a dump site in Abuja, a bulldozer has crushed AstraZeneca shots that were packed in cardboard boxes and plastic as reporters and health officials watch it. The National Primary Health Care Development Agency Executive Director Faisal Shwaib says that a shortage of vaccine supplies on the continent had forced Nigeria to take the doses, knowing fully well they had short life self. Governments on the continent of over 1 billion people have been pushing for more vaccine deliveries as inoculation rates lag richer regions. The lower vaccination levels raise the risk of higher infection and death rates from COVID-19, especially as new, fast-spreading variants emerge, such as Omicron. Health Minister Osachi Ehanire has said Nigeria will no longer accept vaccines with a short shelf life, citing a presidential committee decision. The World Health Organization has said up to 13 million vaccines doses have been administered in Nigeria as of 19 December. Africa's most populous country, with a population exceeding 200 million, has recorded 227,000 COVID-19 cases and up to 3,000 deaths since the pandemic started. Health experts say Nigeria needs to triple its vaccination drive from just over 100,000 doses a day to meet its targets to inoculate more than half its population by the end of next year. Recently, like many other African countries, Nigeria has seen a surge in vaccine supply, which has highlighted other issues relating to distribution and hesitation by citizens to get inoculated. And nothing compares to nature's beauty. The bluish cave, which varies in shape each year, has a rounded ceiling made of thick ice about 5 meters high and is about 20 meters long. The tunnel is accessible by foot in 15 minutes from the chairlift at Glacier 3000 above the resort of Lee Jalebrehe, but at your own risk, organizers have said. The natural cave, also known as the mill, forms through a siphon effect. Each spring and summer, the cavity fills with water from the snow melt, forming a lake. In autumn, the plug disappears and the water drains, leaving the cave. After the break, a look at all the latest sports news.
EAC News fully supports the Royal Government of Cambodia's preventative and administrative measures against COVID-19. But we need you to play your part in helping bring the 20 February community transmission event to an end. Wash your hands regularly, sanitize wherever possible. Keep an eye on your body temperature. Use the Stop COVID QR code and maintain a safe social distance. But above all, please, please, please wear a mask. Only together can we beat COVID-19. EAC News' audience is growing. Our YouTube channel has over 150,000 verified subscribers. To mark the milestone, we've received the Silver Creator Award from YouTube. It's given to channels with over 100,000 subscribers. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki says the award celebrates EAC News' hard work and incredible achievement. She says we've brought a unique voice and style to the world but have also created valuable connections and built a community along the way. The next milestone we're going for is 1 million subscribers, and we'd really like that Gold Creator Award. So if you're not already a subscriber, head to YouTube and search for EAC News. Subscribers get alerts when the Daily Roundup is premiering and live events are streaming. Get all the latest breaking news and updates from Cambodia in English. The EAC News Channel on YouTube, Cambodia Made Clear. If it's happening and you need to know about it, you'll get it all right here. EAC News brings you updates and breaking news in English across all of our platforms and channels. The EAC News app, YouTube, Facebook, Telegram, Twitter, and our website, www.eacnews.asia. Join me, Andrew Barnes-Roberts, and the rest of the EAC News team every day on your favorite channels. EAC News, Cambodia made clear. The National Hockey League confirmed on Wednesday that it will not permit its players to compete in the men's ice hockey tournament at the Beijing Olympics due to COVID-19 concerns and the highly transmissible Omicron variant as the coronavirus spreads globally. This will be the second successive Winter Olympics that the NHL has withdrawn their players, having pulled out from the 2018 Pyeongchang Games over fears of possible player injuries. The NHL agreed last September to pause its regular season so the world's top players could compete in Beijing, with the caveat it could withdraw if COVID-19 disruptions force games to be rescheduled during the Olympics window. That had begun looking increasingly likely in recent days, with the NHL being forced to postpone 50 games in Canada and the United States after a growing number of players entering COVID-19 protocols while Omicron tore through professional sports leagues with fully vaccinated players testing positives. On the Olympic thing, I think if that is the case, it's obviously, in my opinion, a smart decision. I mean, I don't know who would really want to go in the, under those circumstances, you know, especially, you know, I just put myself in that situation with, with the family and this and that. There's zero chance that you, you'd want to run the risk of being stuck over there. The NHL had until the 10th of January to withdraw from the Beijing Olympics held between 4th and 20 February without financial penalty. Players had mostly been eager to return to the largest international stage, but concerns that a positive test in China could lead to a 21-day quarantine and delay returning to their families and NHL clubs had dampened that enthusiasm for some. Being able to be stuck over there was the whole quarantine situation. And, but at the end of the day, I mean, you, you always you have a chance to represent your country. It's always a big honor and you want to do that. but. At the same time, I mean, there's a lot on stake and um, 
So I mean, we just gotta see what the decision going to be and whatever case it will be, we'll we'll see how it goes. Back in 2015, when Beijing was named as the host for the 2022 Winter Olympics, Shanghai entrepreneur Yi Kai decided to tap into the growing enthusiasm for the winter sports within the country. Three years later, with two Austrian partners, Yi opened a store centered on an alpine simulator, a supersized treadmill for snowboarders and skiers to get a taste of the slopes without having to actually leave the urban city. Now the chain is looking forward to expanding its business amid the upcoming Beijing Olympics in February. Six-year-old Li Wenxuan moved skillfully on her skis as she listened to her instructor during a training session. This would have looked like a normal skiing class, except Li wasn't on a mountain slope in the outdoors. Instead, she was in a stylish mall in China's commercial capital of Shanghai. As shoppers and children watched from various points of view in the mall, Li, fully equipped with ski gear and a helmet, zipped from side to side on a moving slope which ran underneath her. I love skiing. I come to ski six times a week. Skiing here makes me feel the same as skiing on real snow. I want to be a champion in the Olympics. Snow 51 has indoor skiing, so I brought her here to have a try. She really wants to participate in this sport. Even when I told her I would like to buy her a gift, she told me no, and she only wanted to ski. So we resolutely signed her up for the ski course. At the beginning, I wanted to train her uh, courage and sporting spirit, but slowly I found out she's quite suitable for this sport and she's pretty good at it. So after participating in several competitions, she has decided to want to become an athlete and we will absolutely give her our support. Snow 51 has now grown into a chain comprising of 23 outlets in high-end shopping malls in cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen. It is one of many local winter sports businesses that have sprung up since Beijing's Winter Olympics announcement, with the hope that the fervor will persist beyond the games, especially for young skiing aspirants like Li. It imitates the feeling of real snow with a very special layer of material on it. When we ski and train on this machine with this layer of material, the equipment used and the essential movements are exactly the same as those on real snow. But compared with real snow, its friction is four to five times that of real snow. So because of its much greater friction, you have to do curving movements. The founder of Snow 51 plans to expand the number of their stores to some 300 facilities in the next five years. Now let's have a look at the weather and see what you can expect for tomorrow. Finally, could Jurassic Park actually happen? It's part of popular culture to dream about the day when dinosaurs are walking amongst us. The latest discovery in China could have science fiction enthusiasts think that day has finally come. 
One of the best preserved dinosaur embryos ever found has been announced in science journals. It is so well preserved, we can observe its posture very clearly, which allows us to compare it with other dinosaurs as well as modern birds. All great science fiction must be science first and fiction second. Even more, it must tap into the reigning scientific paradigm of its era. For Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the paradigm was electricity, the sizzling lighting bolts and arcing volts that were powering the nascent industrial revolution. For Godzilla, it was radioactivity and the bomb. For Jurassic Park, it is biotechnology. The manipulation of cells and genes has produced three cloned mice, pigs containing human DNA. According to the 1990 Michael Christian novel that Jurassic Park is based on, Biotech is headed toward using mosquitoes and blood-sucking flies to undo the dinosaur's extinction. Perhaps life can find a way, though. A controversial paleontologist, who also just happens to be a scientific consultant to the Jurassic Park franchise, thinks that we might have an all-DNA we need, in chickens. Scientists have managed to tweak poultry DNA to grow alligator-like teeth and a dinosaur-like snout instead of a beak. But that's more to it now. After a 72 million year old dinosaur embryo has been discovered inside a fossilized egg that scientists describe as one of the best preserved specimens of its kind ever found. The embryo, dubbed Baby Yingliang, was discovered in Ganzhou in southern China. It belongs to a toothless theropod dinosaur, or Oviratorosaur, and is 72 to 66 million years old. Scientists from the University of Birmingham in the UK and the China University of Jail Sciences in Beijing have observed the embryo in a tucking position, which was previously thought to be the pre-hatching behavior of birds. Fion Wai Sun Ma, a joint lead author of the study from Birmingham University, said this behavior has long been thought unique to birds. But now, they see evidence in the fossil that even in known bird dinosaurs, they might have the same type of pre-hatching behavior. The fossilized egg was discovered in late Cretaceous rock in 2000, but scientists have been examining in over the past four years when the embryo inside was found. The findings of the study were published on Tuesday. After careful fossil preparation, basically we, we see the whole skeleton very clearly, although some body parts are still embedded inside the dinosaur egg. And we can see a very, um, very clean and well-preserved skull, which doesn't have any teeth. And this feature is actually, a, um, it's very typical in oviraptorosaur. And because of this feature, um, we assigned and together with other anatomical features, we assigned this specimen to oviraptorosaur. So in modern day birds, they have a unique behavior called tucking. So starting from day 17, they will um, curl their body up with its head in between its legs. And then on uh, 18 day, 19 day, until day 20, they will start to move into a final tucking posture that is putting their right wing on top of his head. And this posture was suggested to help um, the birds stabilize when they try to crack the eggshell um, using its beak. So, and this behavior has long been thought unique to birds, but now we see evidence in our fossil that even in non-bird dinosaurs, they might have the same type of pre-hatching behavior. Thank you for watching the Daily Roundup here on the EAC News Channel. For more breaking news and updates, check out our website, eacnews.asia, or search EAC News on Telegram or at your favorite app store. More from the EAC News team tomorrow night at 8 p.m. We'll see you then.